Welcome back to our click revision series on an inspector calls. In this video, we're going to be focusing on Gerald Croft. We'll look at his background and how he fits into the Burling family before and after the inspector's visit, and how he knew Eva Smith, or Daisy Renton as she was called by then. We'll also take a look at his relationship with Sheila in a little more detail. So, Gerald Croft is the outsider at the dinner table, but he's sitting with Sheila, so we know they're a couple. Gerald gets the most complicated description at the start of the play, but the image of him that J.B. Priestley is trying to build is really clear once you work out what he's trying to say. Straight away, we can see that Gerald is about 30, so he's a good few years older than Sheila. He's described as too manly to be a dandy, but very much the well-bred man about town, which we can break down. A dandy is someone who cares too much about his appearance and is usually foppish and a bit feminine, the sort of man who always looks impeccable. And Gerald's too manly for that, so he's well-dressed but still masculine with it. Well-bred means he comes from an important family, making him upper class. And a man about town basically means he's a bit of a playboy. He's got a lively social life. Everybody knows him in all the most popular places. So overall, he's a successful, good-looking man who dresses well and gets on with everyone, and all the girls probably swoon when he walks into a room. Yet, he's together with Sheila, and we have to presume Gerald cares about her, because we know his mother isn't pleased with the engagement. Mr. Burling tells Gerald, I have an idea that your mother, Lady Croft, while she doesn't object to my girl, feels you might have done better for yourself, socially. Which means that Gerald is marrying down the social ladder, and his mother disapproves. If we think back to Mr. Burling's excitement at Burling & Company joining up with Crofts Limited, we know that Crofts Limited is the much bigger company, so it's fair to say that Gerald doesn't have as much to gain from it as Mr. Burling. So overall, Sheila seems like a very lucky girl, even if Gerald does have to spend a lot of his time working hard for the family business. But back to the dinner table, and Gerald is being the model guest. He's polite, he's smiling, and he says, I insist on being one of the family now. I've been trying long enough, haven't I? which shows he's relaxed and comfortable. Gerald is, at this point, quite content with himself, and unlike Mr. Burling, who boasts about everything and tries to make himself appear more upper class, Gerald openly admits to not knowing anything about port and doesn't take a cigar because he can't really enjoy them. He's upper class without pretension. He doesn't have to make an effort to be posh. This also means he doesn't have to work very hard in order to make a good impression on Mr. and Mrs. Burling, because he's their social superior, and they both really want the marriage to go ahead. He's even comfortable enough to make a couple of jokes to Mr. Burling. You might notice that these lines, especially calling the Burlings a nice, well-behaved family, hint at the nasty secrets that the Burling family has buried. But that doesn't mean Gerald's suspicious of them. In fact, he's laughing because the idea of the Burling family being hit by a public scandal is so unlikely. People like the Burlings simply don't have that happen to them. Gerald is also teasing Eric here, because apparently everyone in the village of Brumley knows about Eric's drinking problem except Mr. and Mrs. Burling. However, Gerald still recognises the rules of social behaviour, and doesn't want to offend his new in-laws. When the inspector arrives and begins his questions, Gerald at first tries to join in, asking to see the inspector's photograph. But once Mr. Burling's interrogation begins, he asks, Wouldn't you rather I was out of this? Suggesting that he feels uncomfortable witnessing Mr. Burling being interrogated. He's also surprised when the inspector asks him to stay, so we can assume he was hoping just to say goodnight and sneak out the door at this point. However, as he's staying, he offers support to Mr. Burling, and basically agrees with everything his new father-in-law says. He criticises working-class factory girls, saying they wouldn't be able to afford to go on strike. He agrees with Mr. Burling that he was right to sack Eva Smith. And he agrees with Mr. Burling that factory workers shouldn't be allowed to fight for better pay and working conditions. But interestingly, he also sides with Mr. Burling against both Sheila and the inspector. If we look at these lines... We can see that Gerald believes Burling did the right thing by firing Eva Smith, and is trying to protect Mr. Burling, either from the inspector's questions, or Sheila looking at him a bit funny. But we can also see that Gerald isn't just a sheep, and that he actually has strong opinions. He's also not afraid to use his high class to get what he wants, as we can see when he tries to stand up to the inspector. 
At this point in the play, Gerald does not show sympathy for the dead girl. We're respectable citizens, not criminals, he says, as if someone who is respectable could never commit a crime. So clearly he is more concerned with the reputation of the Burling family and hiding beneath his wealth and family name than he is with Eva Smith. The last line here, fortunately it isn't left to you, is it, is particularly pointed. Gerald is telling Inspector Gould that it isn't left to him to draw the line between good people and criminals because that sort of moral decision is made by the people in society with all the power, the upper class people. Gerald is basically telling the inspector to recognise his place in the social hierarchy and not get ideas above his station. So this is the point when Gerald is at his most confident, his most puffed up, and he's standing up to the inspector the most here. It's the moment where he is most like Mr and Mrs Burling, and it's also the moment when everything falls apart for him. Because it's right about now that Inspector Gould first mentions the name Daisy Renton. Gerald Croft first met Daisy Renton in March 1911, just over a year before the play is set, and two months after she was sacked by Millwards and changed her name from Eva Smith. He had an affair with her until September 1911, so they were seeing each other for about six months. During this time, Daisy moved into a vacant apartment belonging to one of Gerald's friends, and he gave her money regularly to support herself. He also told Sheila that he was too busy at work to see her, when he was actually spending the majority of his free time with his new mistress. In September, Gerald had to go away on business, and he ended the relationship. It's April 1912 now, so Gerald has been holding on to this secret for a year, and presumably proposed to Sheila and began arranging a wedding with that knowledge weighing on his conscience. However, like Mrs Burling, he is able to avoid judging himself because he is upper class and is used to getting away with it. We can actually see a change in Gerald's character the moment he first hears the name Daisy Renton. His facade, his wall of respectability just collapses in front of him, and he's unable to hide his shock. It is clear that Gerald knew the girl, not just to the audience, but to everyone in the room. The stage directions show that he does a rubbish job of hiding his surprise, and from his instant request for a glass of whiskey and Sheila's wordless reaction to that, it's clear that she can see straight through him as well. Nonetheless, Gerald still tries to deny it, and even when he's been rumbled, he acts in a cowardly way and begs Sheila to help him hide the truth from the inspector. Let's have a look at this exchange between the two of them. What's evident is that, despite his shock, Gerald doesn't feel like his actions could have caused Eva Smith's death. He says, I don't come into this suicide business, even after he's seen Sheila blaming herself for something that happened earlier. At this point, he has the choice between coming clean to Sheila and everyone else, or trying to worm his way out of the situation. This is what he says. Inspector, I think Miss Burling ought to be excused any more of this questioning. She's nothing more to tell you. She's had a long, exciting, and tiring day. We were celebrating our engagement, you know. And now she's obviously had about as much as she can stand. You heard her. Basically, Gerald is trying to push the focus of the room onto Sheila here, and to get her out of the room to protect himself at the same time. Not only is this condescending and rather sexist, but it results in him actually being mean to Sheila as he tries to defend himself. This passage is a great example of how the inspector turns the Burlings against one another without actually doing very much, but it also shows how immature Gerald is under the surface. He'll do anything at this point to deflect attention away from his affair. Once he buckles and opens up to the inspector, Gerald is fairly honest about the situation, but because he's A, cheated on Sheila, and B, just been mean to her, Gerald has to undergo his interrogation with Sheila making snide, sarcastic remarks at every available opportunity. He's also forced to give the sordid details of his affair in front of his mother and father-in-law, so he's well out of his comfort zone at this point and clearly uncomfortable. Gerald describes Daisy Renton as a girl who looked quite different. She was very pretty, soft brown hair and big dark eyes, and looked young and fresh and charming and altogether out of place. Furthermore, when he met her, she was being sexually assaulted by Alderman Megatee, a respected upper-class member of society, so it gave Gerald a chance to rescue her and look like a hero, which he admits he enjoyed. But there is also a genuine sense of pity in the way he describes Daisy Renton. Gerald tells the inspector that he insisted Daisy move into his friend's empty lodgings and take some money, which, as we've established, is how J.B. Priestley feels that all upper-class people deal with all their problems. But he does say that he felt sorry for her, and clearly felt at the time like he was doing a good thing, as though perhaps he were acting with some sort of misguided social conscience. 
However, it's also clear that Gerald ended the relationship, and that Daisy Renton took it better than I'd hoped. She was very gallant about it. Nonetheless, Sheila appears to respect Gerald for his honesty, despite her continued sarcastic remarks and the fact she is clearly hurt by Gerald's betrayal, saying, And now at least you've been honest. Furthermore, Gerald is not surprised when Sheila gives him back his engagement ring and says, I was expecting this. Which at least tells us on some level that he never thought he would get away with it. Now, this doesn't help Sheila, obviously, especially since after their initial shock, her parents are quick to gloss over the affair. Mr. Burling even says, Now, Sheila, I'm not defending him, but you must understand that a lot of young men, which would look to a lot of people like he's trying to defend Gerald, even if he says he isn't. So at this point, Gerald is in a horrible position. He goes out to get some air, knowing his fiancée doesn't trust him and has returned his engagement ring. His mother-in-law thinks he's disgusting, and that the girl he had an affair with just killed herself. At this point, he has the choice whether to apologise to Sheila and try to make amends for his behaviour, or try to wriggle out of the situation. Unfortunately for him and the Burlings, he chooses to try and wriggle out of it. When he returns, he's ready to rebuild that wall of respectability by discrediting the inspector's version of events. Gerald is the person who reveals that Inspector Ghoul wasn't a police officer, which causes Mr. Burling to concoct his elaborate theory that the whole evening has been some sort of practical joke. This immediately sides him back with the older Burlings and away from Sheila and Eric, who at this point are still extremely remorseful. Here are just some of the questions Gerald throws into the air to confuse the Burlings' memory of events. But is it a fact? Did we? Who says so? Because I say there's no more real evidence we did than there was that chap was a police inspector. But how do you know it's the same girl? How do you know it's the same photograph? Did you see the one your father looked at? And did your father see the one he showed you? Now, what happened after I left? Did anybody else see it? And how do we know she was really Eva Smith or Daisy Renton? Did he ask you to identify a photograph, Eric? How do we know any girl killed herself today? He asks a lot of questions. And as Sheila takes on the role of inspector and tries to force her family to see the wrong they have done, Gerald almost takes on the opposite role and tries to show to the Burlings how nothing that has happened throughout the evening could actually matter. Because by this point, Gerald has the most to lose by believing the inspector's story. At the end of the play, we don't know what will happen between Gerald and Sheila, but it's clear that Gerald is prepared to side back with Mr. and Mrs. Burling and brush the whole affair under the carpet. Thanks for watching. That's everything on Gerald for now. Our next video will focus on Eric Burling, but we'd recommend attempting to write a few sentences in answer to each of these questions before you move on. Question 1. What took place between Gerald and Daisy Renton? Try to answer clearly and in chronological order. Question 2. Does Gerald show any signs of change or development throughout the play? Question 3. Do you think J.B. Priestley wants the audience to feel sorry for Gerald? Try to refer to specific moments or lines from the play to support your opinions.